Welcome to the Tracks Podcast. I'm your host, Luke Kennedy. Today, our two guests are Jerry Lopez and Stacey Peralta. While neither individual requires an introduction, Jerry is best known as the surfer who revolutionized tube riding at Pipeline in the 70s. He is also a revered shaper, an actor with Hollywood credits, and a self taught yoga master. Meanwhile, Stacey was at the coalface of his own four wheeled revolution in the late 70s and early 80s. We saw him become a world number one skateboarder before spearheading the formation of Power Peralta Skateboards. Eventually, he moved into directing, writing, and producing films. In 2001, he won Best Director at the Sundance Film Festival for his documentary Dogtown and Z-Boys. After writing the screenplay for the dramatisation of Dogtown, he went on to make the critically acclaimed documentaries Riding Giants and Crips and Bloods. Jerry and Stacey recently collaborated with Patagonia Films to make the biopic The Yin and Yang of Jerry Lopez. Well, thanks very much for joining us, Stacey and Jerry. Uh, loved the show last night. Very entertaining. I'll try and weave in a few questions that perhaps weren't answered by the film and uh, also talk about it a little bit also. So, Jerry, just starting with you, you going way back now, you went to Punahou in, in Honolulu. It was you know, probably one of the best schools in Hawaii. Uh, your mother was a teacher. Your dad was college educated. Was, was there always a sense growing up that education you know was important that you learned to approach something with a a critical mind absolutely i mean you know when i graduated from high school every single person in our graduating class went to college and that was just the way it was supposed to be and you know my both my parents were they were grooming me to go to college as well and it was when I got in college that I started uh, drifting. <laughs> and surfing had played a big part in that drift. But um, no, when I finished high school and went across to California to go to college, I was focused on college and the education and thought I was going to become an architect. Didn't work out that way. This is all of this was in the film originally, but we had to cut the film down, unfortunately. But one of the things that we had in the film that I'm really sorry we had to get rid of is Jerry's parents encouraged him to become a reader, and they he took it. The father took the kids to reading reading groups, libraries. libraries. Yeah, that's where we did. Yeah, they they'd spend time in libraries, and we had all these pictures of Jerry reading books as a kid, and so we developed the the love of reading early. But it was one of those things where we just there were so many parts of his life, it was just too much. So we had to cut it down. And I guess to counterbalance that, though, it, it was also kind of a, a free-range upbringing in a way. I mean, in your book, you talk about hunting for octopus on Kauai at your grandmother's place and surfing. So it wasn't kind of a helicopter parenting scenario either. You kind of had scope to roam and uh, take I think, risks. I think it was a different world completely back then. You know, that not that kids were left to their own devices, but, you know, there was... a expected behavioral pattern that that you adhere to as a, as a child and if you screwed up you know ooh boy you know cuz our father never ever hit us but our mother threatened that he would you know <laughs> and that was just the threat of that was enough and um i think that was the way it was with most of the kids that that we knew and grew up with is, you know, you towed the line. It's just, like I said, it was a different world. And um, it's changed a lot. I mean, Stacey, your own upbringing, I guess, uh, you know, you were kind of roaming in the streets of Santa Monica at a young age, learning to take calculated risks. How important was that for you? You know, it's a really good question. I think back I think back a lot about that on my life because like Jerry, my parents were less interested in education. They wanted me to have a job. As long as I had a job, they were like, "Okay, he's fine. He'll go, you know, we don't have to worry about him." So I always kept a job. And so if the waves were really really good, I could convince my mom to let me take a day off school. Oh. Yeah, she, but only once in a while, but she would do stuff like that. Um, my dad didn't weigh in, but my mom kind of, you know, ran things. So 
they knew what I was doing. They knew I was, you know, going into backyards, but I don't think they thought a lot about it. But it taught me to really be aware of my surroundings, extremely hyperly aware, because what I wanted to do was illegal. And so I had to be aware of what was behind me, uh, uh, you know, in front of me, on the sides of me. Are the neighbors hearing us? Are we making too much noise? Did we go in the right way? Where's the out that we go in? So I've always been extremely aware of stuff. Also, when I went to school, I went to really intensely racially mixed schools. And there was a lot of fighting as a result of that. And a lot of people didn't like surfers. And we were like light bulbs with our blonde hair walking around school. So we were targets. As a result of that, I had to watch my back at school all the time. I hated school, man. It was like going to a penitentiary, (laughs) you know? And I hated it because of that, because I had to fear for my life every day. But it taught me to, like, that guy you don't want to ever be around. That group over here, don't ever be around those guys. Don't walk down this hallway. So it it was awareness training is what it was. A, di- a different education, yeah. Um, Jerry, you talk about in the film having this epiphany moment down in Mexico when you were at college where you're in the surf and you crawl up onto a rock and you kind of start visualising yourself surfing, not just surfing, kind of ripping. I mean, it was a kind of a neat film device, but was it? did, did that happen? And, oh, and did absolutely. You... Yeah, no, you know, and later on um, when I understood what happened, I realised that was a very um, real moment of self-visualization that has become, uh, you know, quite a useful and well-used technique by for training by coaching, all you know, for different sports. But it had just, you know, occurred on its own, just there. And I mean, you know. Maybe I was stoned a little bit too, but um, <laughs> it really was startling that, you know, for the first time, you know, I had to look several times and shit, that's me I'm, that I was seeing. Did you consciously use that technique in the future? Did you actually visualize yourself riding pipeline before you did it sometimes? <clears throat> there was a lot of dreaming. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> You know, asleep and awake. <laughs> and you talk about uh, yoga coming into your life quite early on, earlier than I expected, probably your early 20s, yeah. and you develop this obsession. <clears throat> but you're kind of pretty busy. Uh, you're shaping boards, you're surfing, and you're fitting in yoga. Like, how do you get this sort of triangulated life going? How, how rigid were you with your attitude and approach? Well, I mean, you know, it was a learning process, and... But I was interested, and I got Reno interested, and, you know, we were um, living together uh, and went through several different houses, and so, you know, we were right into it, and we practiced a lot, and actually, it was a friend from high school, um, his name was Howard Fukushima, (laughs) we called him the hip nip, and... um, he had this, you know, he was long and lanky, had this tremendously flexible body, and, you know, we were smoking a lot of dope together, and we uh, would, you know, practice our yoga when we were stoned. And it so it was, quite a, it was quite a fluid approach to it as well. It wouldn't be like, okay, we do our yoga in the morning, we shape boards in the day, surf all day, and then shape. It was kind of... It sort of just evolved as part of your lifestyle. Yeah, I mean, you never knew what you were going to do. You know, you went surfing when the waves were good or, you know, when you could. And, um, you know, it was different, though. There really wasn't a lot of consideration. The tide never made that much difference. But, you know, if the surf was up, you wanted to go earlier. But, you, you know... You want to go surfing? Yeah, let's go. Can I ask a question? Sure. When did he's an incredibly disciplined person? You know, wakes up at four every morning, does yoga for three hours or something. When did discipline? When did self discipline enter your life? Your own self discipline, where you said, "I got to do this myself." I mean, I guess it was already starting, you know, because 
I really thought about a lot of things before I did them. And, um, you know, I guess there was some kind of discipline in that. And then, you know, I started to figure out that, shit, there's a lot of things you got to do to advance and, and, you know, learn how to do these things. So it was always there, but it just kind of, you know. Hadn't developed yet? Yeah, I think I was just obsessive, you know, and that's a part of, if you can channel discipline into obsessiveness, then kind of. A little OCD? Well, I mean, not like that, but just, you know, I'd focus on something and, man, that's what I wanted to do, and then, you know. He does have that ability. I've noticed him. He has this ability to see something, and he doesn't hear anything else. You could be in his presence, and you're not even there. He's, like, looking at that thing so focused in such a focused manner. I've really seen that in him. You've seen it kick in. I mean, is that what it was like with Pipeline? Obviously, surfing was fun, but Pipeline seemed like something else. It was like a, it was a quest. It was an Everest. It was a challenge. It, it was something you had to figure out. Is that what it was like? Oh, there was a lot of figuring out. But, you know, again, I mean, I thought about this a lot just in actually on this trip that um, and I've thought about it before too that the pipeline wasn't popular back then the late 60s very early 70s there was a handful of guys that would come and most of them would only come when it was kind of good I would go every day you know and if I saw one good wave I'd go out and a lot of those times when I went out, there wasn't anybody on the beach, there wasn't anybody out in the water. And that's, you know, all I had to see was just one good wave. And I'd just go out there and wait for another wave like that. And, you know, there'd be a lot of bad waves, and I didn't mess with those. But I think what that did was there was a... Um, a real empty space for me to figure that place out. And, you know, I'd go down to Sunset, which was the main spot, and, man, everybody would be there. And that's even harder to figure out than the <laughs> pipeline. But the pipeline, you know, I had some really good quiet time where I could really learn a lot about how that wave broke and where it broke and, you know, the whole um, development of the surfboard went along with that. And, I mean, it's the sort of wave I imagine where you inch closer towards it. You don't just charge out there straight away. No, it's but pretty fearsome. Can you, can you remember kind of a moment where you sort of went, okay, I'm sitting a little deeper here. This feels a little different. I'm kind of, I'm kind of walking on the moon. You know, this is, this is completely different now. I'm somewhere else on the wave. This is like a, a kind of a, that, that sort of a wow moment starts to happen. I mean, it wasn't any one moment. I remember, actually, there was a couple of moments. One real um, revealing moment was one morning I was out there, and it was a glassy morning, which the pipeline is okay when it's glassy. It's, it's easier on the takeoff, but a lot of times it, the tube isn't, as big as it is when the wind's helping it. And I remember, you know, pulling into a wave, and usually what happened if the wave closed out in front of you, you dove off, and you tried to get away from your board. And for some unknown reason or another, (laughs) I just stayed with it, and I rode... Because you're going pretty fast when you're in the tube. That was when the <clears throat> surfboard went the fastest. Mm-hmm. And, you know, so <laughs> you're right on the edge of control. But I went all the way until, you know, the foam ball was right there on the closeout. Went right into it and slowed down and, you know, tumbled and came up. My board was right next to me. You came out the back. No, I mean, 
the wave just collapsed on me, pushed me straight down. And when I popped up, and it wasn't bad, when I popped up, my board was right next to me. I went, holy cow. And I you know, didn't think of it right then. I just grabbed it, paddled out of the way of the next wave. And I thought about it you know, as I was paddling out and went, huh, that was interesting. And so the next time that happened, instead of diving off, like everyone did, I stayed on my board, rode it right to the end, you know, where it sl- started to slow down, stopped when it ran into the, the closeout that was coming at me. My board popped up right next to me again. I went, wow, I think I just learned something. I don't have to swim to the beach. And that was, you know, one thing that I, I recall that... Um, was really a big lesson, and that was just one morning. And I came in from that session and went, "Man, okay, I got to pay attention a little more because you know there's little things like this that are really going to help me learn this place a lot better." And you know, while everybody else had to swim all the way in to get their board, I didn't figure it out. And so I got to get more waves. But it was really the figuring out process. It wasn't just a matter of figuring out the wave. It was figuring out the wave and figuring out the board that would work on the wave. I mean, you talk a lot about also yeah. the evolution. Was there a lot of like go surfing, driving back to town, dreaming about the, the next board, the one that might be oh, yeah. success? You know, all that kind of process would kick in. Was that the consciousness of it all? Well, especially because, you know, you usually only had one surfboard and... They didn't last long at the park. <laughs> that place broke more surfboards than anywhere. And, you know, you had to go and make another one so you'd have a surfboard. And the whole time, I think I talked about it last night, you're thinking about, you know, what do I need to do to make that board better? And that was constant. That never stopped. Talk to us about the Coral Cruiser, the one that was kind of, you know, yeah. thought about as the board that really enabled you to make a giant leap forward at Pipeline. What were the definitive characteristics? The nine-inch tail. It had this pintail that after, you know, because I drew it and it looked okay when I had drawn the outlines. So I cut it out and then, then I looked at it and went, ooh, this is pretty pointy here. And, you know, it was a the tail, a nine-inch tail would have been common on a 10-foot Waimea gun. It was very uncommon on an eight-foot pipeline board. And then I think you'd also been influenced by Mike Heinsohn with the right, the down rails. Yeah, that played a factor as well. All the boards yep. at that point, yep. you know, we were using the down rail. Yeah. And Stacy, I mean, do you sometimes, when you were making this film, see parallels between your life and jerry's a little bit i mean board design was a big part of your experience you're also at the cutting edge of a a subculture at an important time been involved in film there are there are some parallels there no there's huge parallels because we were both at the starting line of uh, he was at the starting line of modern surfing i was at the starting line of modern skateboarding we invented pool riding on roller skate equipment roller skate equipment i mean it's it was dangerous you talk about poor equipment we had the worst stuff in the world and somehow we did it which is remarkable um plus i'm a surfer and i grew up in the shortboard revolution which was a terrible time to grow up because every six months i had another horrible surfboard because as jerry has said no one knew where it was going to land no one knew what the shortboard should be. Should it be the twin fin, the pig, you know, on all those different variations. And I had all of them and they were all terrible, you know? So kids come in to skate or kids come into surfing now and they have a, a board that actually works. They can excel quicker. And I guess you have to figure out how to make a better skateboard as well. That was a big which, part of your evolution. Which also. we did. And that's the same thing. Trucks, like uh, trucks, wheels and boards were expanding on a weekly basis. Everything was going wider until it became so wide that it was unrideable. So it was a constantly, the, the terrain was exploding and the equipment was exploding simultaneously. You know, but I, I want to add one thing about Jerry. 
in my gen, you know, I'm a few generations behind him, but we, he was a hero of mine, pictures on my wall and my bedroom and stuff like that. The, there was two words that we used in our vocabulary back then, which were aggressive and radical. That was the benchmark of everything we thought about. Is it radical? Is it aggressive? Did you do it aggressively? Jerry, it's like the world was ready for him and was ready for Pipeline. If you think about, we were also propelled by Evil Knievel. He was the first <laughs> maniac that, that was breaking through things. And so Jerry was, his timing with Pipeline was perfect because it was what we were all after. That was the most radical thing happening in surfing at that time. He was riding the most radical, aggressive wave and he was getting barreled, which we had never seen before. We hadn't seen people disappear before. And he, those guys were doing it at Pipeline. And so at that time of, of, of in surfing, he appeared in every single surf movie in every magazine because Pipeline and Sunset were the two showpiece waves in the world at that time. Did you ever worry, Jerry, that the endorphin kick from Pipe was so high that the, the, everything else would be like a come down afterwards? Did you, ever, did, that, did you ever have that fear, like, what's going to beat this? No, I mean, <laughs> you know, <laughs> Sunset was kind of the same jolt. Yeah. And, you know, and to a lesser degree, um, all of them were. Holly Eva, Valsi Lan. Those were all, um, you know... It's all dependent on where the waves were good that day, but no, I got a. I think I got an equal jolt from all of them. You know, I got my ass kicked a little more at the pipeline than the other spots, but um, I got them. I got my ass kicked at all the spots. So if you go to pipeline today, like every single wave is documented, whether it's by yeah. camera or or film, and Obviously, you surfed there, like you said, you know, on your own a lot of the time, and there was no one documenting it. But at some point, people started to take photos. There's a little bit of footage. Did you start to look at that and try and use that as a little bit of a gauge for feedback? Like, oh, I could be a little bit deeper in the barrel here, or I could do... Did that process kick in? You never saw any of that, you know. And, and actually, I'll tell you a funny story. The first time I saw any film of myself was uh, Colonel Benson, and uh, he had a partner, a really sweet Hawaiian guy named Bill Kaivi, who was a, a very successful local entertainer, singer, and they called him the boy from Lapo Hoi Hoi, and we became friends. You know, we surfed together a lot, mostly in town. Um, but one day he said, hey, I want you to come with me. We're going to go out and... Um, I want you to look at some film because I'm involved with Colonel Benson. I knew, you know, I surfed a lot with his kids and um, they were making a surf movie. And I go, okay, you know, I, why not? He had a nice car and we drove out to Schofield Barracks and we sat down and the Colonel had just come from work. He was still in uniform, you know, he was a full Colonel and um, the family was all there and they started, you know, the projector and ran all this film, and I'm watching it, you know, and I, well, it's Alamoana, you know, and it, well, it looks like a nice day, and watching this guy, oh, who's this fucking coot? <laughs> you know, this guy's awful. And, um, and then, you know, there was other guys, too, I, you know, recognized. And it never dawned on me until... They clicked off the projector and they go, what do you think? And I go, oh, that was cool. I don't want to. No, no, what do you think, you know, about you? And it's just like, oh, shit. That was me? And it was so bad and I was so embarrassed and shocked. And I just went, oh, man. That was the first time I'd ever seen any images of me surfing, you know, I saw a couple of stills here and there, but that was it. So I went, oh, that was really bad. And 
they didn't think it was bad. They thought it was great, you know. And in my mind, I was man, you know, look like my I look like a monkey, arms swinging, super wide stance, you know. And I just went, Ugh. but the point I was trying to make is, you never got to see any of that, and there was no video, you know, nobody was shooting like even Super 8 and then, hey, come over, we got some footage. So you never saw yourself surf. And in a way, that was difficult. But, you know, I guess when I kind of started having some success and more guys started filming the pipeline, um, my style, I guess, had, you know, more or less developed a little better by then. But they started featuring the pipeline more and more in surf movies, you know, so I got to see myself, and then, you know, it's just what you say, like, ooh, <laughs> better keep those arms from swinging like a monkey. The self-critic kicks in, yeah. yeah. Was there ever a sense, I mean, it was all happening pretty fast, as the movie points out, but, you know, you liked, you were shaping boards and, but it's sort of, your book and the movie hints that, you know, you'd rather be surfing than shaping, perhaps. Was there a little part of you in your brain that started to tick over and go, maybe if I just figure this one wave out and get really good out there, I could somehow set myself up by just mastering this one wave? There was never any of that. You know, there was never any idea or even dream that surfing was going to be anything more than just something, you know, that we did to pass the time and have fun at. And the only thing that would come of it was, you know, you always had orders for surfboards to build, so, you, you know, you had a job and you didn't have to go and sell lids or, you know, do any of that kind of stuff that a lot of guys were doing because they wanted to go surfing when the waves were good too. And um, I felt pretty secure in the fact that, you know, okay, all I got to do is work a little, shaping boards, and I can pay for this lifestyle that allows me, anytime the waves are good, I'll be there. In term, Speaking of shape, is, um, I mean, Dick Brewer was a real co-conspirator, I guess, in your shaping evolution and your pipeline quest we, we didn't see too much of dick in the film was that a decision stacy or was that a part of the you know the editing process or it probably would have been but we it's it never we never went down that path yeah, yeah it just never there was a picture of him in yeah, there's a picture yeah. but we never it never jerry we just didn't go down that i didn't it wasn't a choice it wasn't yeah. like something specific and that was a real brief period you know looking back at all the years that have passed. In, you know, I started shaping boards in 1968, and I'd only been shaping boards for about a year. And Dick said one day, hey, I'm going to move over to Kauai and start something over there called Hanapepe Surfboards. And once you come over and... Um, you know, you can do some shaping over there. And basically, it was go shaping for him, you know, just f finishing off some boards or, you know, start to finish. And um, that was only for about a year. And then not even a year, actually. <laughs> Didn't last that long. And then we all went back to, and we're sending all the boards to Surfline Hawaii to sell, which was one of the, well, the biggest shop there. Um, so we went back to Honolulu, and um, the owner of Surfline, we talked about it in the movie, you know, at one point they were all brewer's boards, but he said, all right, well, let's, you know, do your boards. And I went, oh, with my name on it? And he goes, yeah. And I went, you think you can sell them? And he goes, yeah. And so that was the beginning of 
me, you know, having my boards in a shop and having a pretty steady um, <laughs> job. It's a, it's a step, yeah. It's yeah. definitely a step. And then, you know, that was... Brewer wasn't real um, happy about that, you know. <laughs> <laughs> I remember, you know, he was actually kind of upset, and he, he you know, kind of got angry, and, and I said what do you want me to do? You know, and he didn't really know. And um, so that was kind of when we... Went in different directions. It was competitive. Things were competitive. Yeah, yeah not really competitive, but I guess in his mind it was. I yeah. mean, it certainly wasn't for me. You know, I yeah. mean, he was Dick fucking Brewer. Yep. And, you know, <laughs> I was nobody. But I guess he felt that. I mean, we were still great friends, you know, and we spent a lot of time together. But that was the end of our shaping together, really. I, uh, I, I sat next to Peter McCabe last night, which is always entertaining. <laughs> That's what he said. And, uh, you know, it's serving such an individual pursuit. And, you know, Lopez is such an iconic name. But how, how important is it to have sparring partners throughout your career, people that push you and drag you to new places? Well, that's what it's all about. I mean, there's nothing better than surfing with friends, you know. I mean, surfing alone is great these days, but back then you wanted to surf with your mates, and that just enhanced the whole experience. And, you know, the times I got to spend with Peter, especially in G-Land, were, I mean, those were the greatest moments of surfing in my life. He said you'd figure I mean, we talked about it last night, but you two had- by the end of it, you, you knew each other surfing so well that you could take off and easily go doubles on a wave and, and instinctively know what the other person was going to do. We did that a lot. And, you know, we had more fun doing that than riding the waves on our own. We just, you know, a wave would come, and he'd look at me and go, angels, and i go, let's go. And it didn't matter who was in front or who was behind because, you know, that would change the next instant. And it was it was really a beautiful thing. We we called it the Blue Angels, and uh, boy, I'm actually coined that, you know, because he grew up in a naval aviator family, and uh, they really liked to see Petey and I ride the waves together because no one had ever done it quite like that. We were riding full speed. I mean, you know, it was like we could just blend and ride that wave together and and like i said that was the zenith of the movie talks about a period where you stayed at g-land on your own for quite a while after everyone had gone back and you get this sense of what's driving you and perhaps stacy you endeavored to capture this a little bit was this sense of trying to be in a state of mind or uh a consciousness that was different to anyone else in the world at that point in time almost. It's not like a competitive thing, but it's kind of like, wow, like I'm here on the edge of the, the East Java jungle on my own. No one else is on this trip right now. You know, that's kind of, there's almost like that's a bit of a driving force. You know, you say that, but I never thought about that. I mean, <laughs> in that big of a context because... I just didn't want to go back and go out at night and drink and party in the bars and, you know, chase women. That was, I wanted to just stay here and go surfing. And, you know, it was really funny because the waves weren't that good. The waves in G-Land are much better on those big tides and new moon and full moon tides. Mm-hmm. And... The in-between tides is still good. I mean, it's still okay, but it doesn't have that bump that the tide gives it. And um, it didn't matter. Just that being there alone was really, really special. And then after that, you know, was the beginning of us just going, shit, let's just stay here. We don't want to go back to Cuda. There's nothing there for us. When were you more vulnerable, sitting out the back on a 10-foot day at G-Land with no one around or sitting out the back on a you know, 12-foot day at Pipeline? Where did the sense of fear and vulnerability feel perhaps 
more uh, intense. I never even thought about that. <laughs> there, there wasn't any of that. Yeah, you know, it was just, yeah, man. Here we are. Surely in Gland, are you thinking like I've got it? You know, I can't really get this wrong. You know, because yeah. if I do, I'm a long way from civilization. You know, I've been. I, I made writing giants, so I spent a lot of time around big wave writers, and I've been around him. I'm beginning to wonder if these guys have a lack of imagination. <laughs> I'm, I'm not joking when I say that because there, there's there. I wonder if there's the the fear part of their equation just somehow recedes in the back. They just don't seem to think the way everybody else does. Well, you know, imagination is a real important part of the whole, your consciousness. However, you know, the runaway emotions and negative imaginations yes. can really take you down that rabbit hole. And if you can keep those imaginations positive, which I guess we did. I, I think he, you do. You, you do clearly. Yeah, without a doubt. Without, yeah. I mean, he's written Waimea, awesome. He's written everything. But I want to throw something at you. You said, what are the best waves you've ever ridden? You know, you gotta, the film ends with him riding a one-foot river wave and seemingly enjoying it as much as anything. Who would have ever thought? That's like Arnold Palmer. If his, he had a film ending the film with him playing at a putt-putt golf course with children <laughs> and golf. enjoying himself, you know? <laughs> I mean, it, th- th- there were other elements to your career. Obviously, you got to work on um, a couple of major feature films. You got a taste of Hollywood. I guess specifically people would like to know, what was it like when Mr. Pipeline met Mr. Universe? <laughs> <laughs> That's funny. <laughs> Jerry, you son of a bitch. <laughs> I'll tell him what you, about Arnold surfing, what he said. Oh, I can't even remember. Jerry yeah, tr- I, tried to teach Arnold to surf. Well, he came to Maui one time. You know, we, we went over for the Mr. Hawaii contest because that was all his people, which was really, really fun. Um, you know, him and Maria and I um, went to the competition and everything he introduced me to all his friends and then he came to Maui and and uh so I took him surfing one day and Milius was there too and uh you know we we all paddled out and I had a actually a, one of the big Wednesday boards he paddled out on a bear <laughs> and, you know he did pretty good paddling out I mean he certainly was strong enough and We got to the outside, and it was just this little secret spot that I had. It was in this valley out going towards Hana, and, you know, we were the only ones there and only ones on the beach. And we got to the outside, and, you know, I waited for him, and he paddled out. He got out. He sat up on the board. He looked at me, and he looked around, got off the board when the next wave came and shoved the board in. What are you doing? He goes, yeah, this is how I surf. (laughs) (laughs) <laughs> but I, yeah, I guess at least he could, you know, he knew, he knew what it was like to pump iron, but he could at least get some concept then of how how difficult it was to surf. Well, he he was very conscious about his image, you know. I remember one time, you know, I go, do guys ever ask you to, like, arm wrestle or anything? He goes, yeah, they ask me all the time, but I never do it. <laughs> And I go, how come? He goes, because you never win. If you win, they say, ah, you are Arnold Schwarzenegger. And if you lose, ah, then you never hear the end of it. <laughs> so. Speaking of, um, of winning and losing, I love the story in the book where your friend uh, Brian Bulkley, I think it was, like 1980 Pipe Masters, just before he made the movie. Pipe's pretty good, and he paddles up next to you, and he says, hey, Jerry, there's a good set coming. Can I have it? You're more famous than me. Already, I, I kind of need it to build to it build my profile. The pipe masters. Yeah, it was the pipe masters. Yeah, yeah. and yeah. Uh, and you kind of said you kind of relinquished. Yeah, kind of <laughs> took me by oh shit, of course, go for it. So you felt like you'd had your you'd had your taste of fame by then. You felt you had enough of it. Well, I mean, I knew I was leaving that night to yep. go to Spain. You know, and, and film a Hollywood movie. Yeah, he, you know, he really wanted. A chance at the contest, and we lived next door to each other, and <laughs> so I said, just, you know, it was a good move on his part. He just, I just went, whoa, cool. You once said that being successful as a surfer 
in your era was having two pairs of board shorts, one to surf in and one to walk around in. Yeah. Um, um, do you feel successful now? Uh, yeah, I got a lot more shorts. <laughs> I guess you, throughout the court, and the, and the movie goes into it, when commercially Lightning Bolt blew up and you probably it got a little bit overcooked, do you have to make decisions to protect the lifestyle and find the line between commercial reasons for doing things and protecting that lifestyle? Is that something you've learnt to do? Well, I've never really thought that much about it, but that lightning bolt whole, the way it ended, was really, really troubling, I think for all of us, but especially for me because, you know, I saw that um, some people were... I thought were my friends weren't really, you know, they were just, they had another agenda. And that was, um, that was troubling. Stacey, just a couple of quick ones for you. There's so much information to deal with a, someone like Jerry Lopez. How do you climb into that when you're making a film? It was really hard because he has so many unusual chapters to his life. Um, that was the really hard part. This film took longer in editorial than I've ever had in a film. The other thing that was difficult about this film is he has four seminal waves in his life, Ala Moana, Pipeline, Uluwatu, and G-Land. And for the general public, how do you make them understand that how different these waves are, especially Uluwatu to G-Land? How do you, like, that was a struggle. Like, how do we present Uluwatu without letting the audience know that this isn't the wave. The other wave is yet to come. Those were tricky things to do editorially because Uluwatu is an amazing wave. I mean, amazing. But yet there's something else that's even better. So that was a... Editorially, these things were hard to do. And as I said, his life is so full of so many things that we had to condense a lot of stuff down, you know, like the Brewer story. He's also a motorcycler. You know, I mean, rabid. So, and he's toe a... Toe-surfing. Yeah, I mean, all sorts thing. of things. Like, Laird said, why didn't you put toe-surfing in this? It's like... We <laughs> oh, no, you left sp- Laird out. Oh, dear. We ran out of space, <laughs> you know? Just ran out of space. I mean, for you, your, your origin is as a professional skateboarder, and then you became a filmmaker. And if I think about skateboarding, I think of this very, like surfing, narrowly focused endeavor. Filmmaking, you've got to be aware of a whole lot of details, other people, techniques. How did you take that narrow focus... And, and broaden it. I, I think my focus was always broad because I, I always was aware of what we were doing. Like we would be in these backyards and I would be participating and observing at the same time. <laughs> but I had this kind of bipolar experience where I'm really hyperly aware. Like, I don't even believe what we're doing here. This is unbelievable. Yet at the same time, participating head on. So it's been this, like a bipolar experience, except I'm not bipolar, but that's what my life's been like, observing and having a foot inside it simultaneously. Yin and yang. Yeah, yeah. And so, yeah, it's, and it makes for an unusual experience. But I think my, I, I do believe I preferred my career as a mentor and a company owner and as a team coach more than my own skateboarding career. When I formed the Bones Brigade with Tony Hawk and Rodney Mullen and Caballero and all those guys, I actually got more charge out of that than even my own career. On a, on a broader spectrum, in an era that's obsessed with technology and the device and the, and the quick sugar hit of footage, how important is telling a good story? That's all there is. You know, we live in the age of, um, you know, people say that content is king. I think that context is king. There's too much content and there's too little context. We need more stories because without stories, we can't understand things. I open my phone every day and look at things and it's just one exclamation point after another, but there's no connection to the human or the story. And we need that. We need that because it's part of how we dream. We don't dream in exclamation points. We dream in stories and we need to have that in our lives. And I think that's one of the reasons why the surf communities that we've shown this film to have been so appreciative of it because it connects the dots of their own lives because they've lived this as well. That's what I learned from Dogtown is it connected dots that people hadn't realized. Why did this happen? How did this happen? And I think that's really important for us as a culture 
Otherwise, we're just going to be a bunch of dummies. So you used to hunt backyards for swimming pool bowls. Do you now find yourself hunting stories? Is that how, the, is that, is that how your mind works? Now you, you're on, always on the hunt for that next good story? Well, I'm kind of, I mean, I have a similarity to Jerry is that I always have to have something that I'm really focused on, something that's really occupying my mind, because if I don't, my mind just reels off. And so right now it's foil surfing. It's, it's all I can think of. <laughs> Seriously, I have foil brain. Uh, you know, um, I'm in the initial stages of it. I, I do not want to get hurt. I want to be really careful about what I do, just so, like when I learned to kiteboard. And that's where my thinking is right now. Now, I'm also thinking about other things too, potential stories. But having just finished this, I need a break. I need to clear the brain out for a while and do um, and spend some time. Foil, sir. Yeah, and, and meditate, which I, which I do. So much of the film is reflective, Jerry, but what does Jerry look forward to next? <laughs> I mean, you talk so much about being in the present and enjoying the moment, but, and you've talked about Jerry looking forward, you know. He, he, that was one of the difficulties of doing this film is, is getting him to look back because he's always looking so forward. I just think about the next wave, you know. I realize that I'm getting old and there's not a lot of waves left, so I better get a few more before it's all done. Can I actually say one thing? This is again yeah. something Jerry and I have talked about. I meant, did you hear the comment I made about being a kook last yes, night? Yes, I did. It's well, a good comment. Yeah. One thing that I have seen so often in professional athletes is their fear of learning new things. Okay. Being a kook. Uh, being a kook. And so the, the, they're, that they were great at something, it, prevents them from being great at anything else because they won't let that thing go. And the one thing Jerry's done, and I'd like to think of myself, is I want to learn more things. So does he, and he does. He has not let the Mr. Pipeline moniker on him be a tyranny to his life. He released it so that he could be free and liberated to learn more things. And now he's riding river waves, you know, seriously. And also, and all the other forms of surfing, he's done every form of surfing. And he did that by not holding on to the Mr. Pipeline thing. That's a big deal. It's a really big deal. Is it also about having that ability to slip into that state of immersion and transition into something else to allow yourself because you're both your lives are about transitions but you can't do that unless you let go of the yeah. thing that you're known to be because otherwise then that's what i've seen in too many people they don't want to let go of that i'm great at this i'm great at this and they just hold on to it for too long man you know you gotta let go and give it to somebody else and then move on to something new you know but you know what <laughs> i mean I may have been Mr. Pipeline to you, but I was never Mr. Pipeline to me. <laughs> I never was, you know. It just. It was a tag that somebody gave you. Yeah, I mean, you know. But you earned it. I, I could never, I would never compare myself to Butch Van Arsdalen or Jock Sutherland. I mean, they were both friends, but to me, you know, they were people that I still look up to. And, you know, they were Mr. Pipelines, not me. Stacy, will you wander down the end of the street and check out the Bondi Bowl? Will you do that? Will that little party of brain go? I've got to go and check out that skate bowl down at the end of the road. Yeah, but, but also I'll tell you, every time I'm in a plane and I'm coming into a city... I'm always looking out the window for empty pools. Always, <laughs> to this day. Just for the sake of, just to, for the beauty of it. Always looking. Or the full pools to think, oh, that's a rideable one. Always. I'll always do that. Boy, if you had a drone back then. Huh? <laughs> <laughs> we, we would have been dangerous with drones. But we were dangerous anyways. Yeah. We were really like rats. We knew what to look for. If you saw a garbage bin in front of a house, you knew that house was being remodeled. And that was instantly, there's a pool back there. It's probably empty. It's the instinct. Well, in, in danger of not letting go and passing it on to someone else. Thanks very much, guys. Appreciate your time. Thanks, Lou. Thanks. Love the movie and good luck with the rest of the tour. Yeah. Thank you.